Hello, listener, and welcome to this preview of our latest Patreon-exclusive episode. To continue the conversation and listen to the full episode, head over to the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon. The link is in the show notes. Hello, patrons, and welcome to this patron-exclusive episode of Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery, the 1997 film directed by Jay Roach and written by Mike Myers. Happy April Fool's Day. I'm joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Arand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. And Alex Cayeros. <laughs> Hi. Uh, okay, so we're talking about Austin Powers. Uh, Alex, why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're here because of me, because I put this on my top 10 films of the 90s. Uh, because... This movie was like a big deal for me. It was like my first favorite comedy, maybe. I mean, maybe not my first, but but like in my like er, early preteen adolescence, like I loved this movie. And I think I watched it so much, probably because my parents also liked it. I think they loved the James Bond spoofiness of it and the 60s-ness of it. So it was like a common, you know, blockbuster video rental. And and I don't know, it's not with this movie. It, it feels like the best of sketch comedy, the best of just like silly satire. Uh, I I just find this movie delightful from start to finish. I always laugh. I'm always having a good time. Um, I I think there's a there's like a charm in this movie that as the series goes on, it's a little more vulgar, a little more pushing boundaries. This first movie feels like it's in this kind of sweet spot of pushing things but never kind of quite crossing the line into like so gross out so raunchy that it becomes a little bit like Ugh. this movie just feels like this beautiful little package of mike myers snl spoofy 90s-ness and i love it so that is why we are here because of that <laughs> right, there you go patrons uh <laughs> I hope you're satisfied. Yeah, I mean, so it's really interesting revisiting this movie 26 years after it came out. This is a very old movie at this point. Oh. Uh, because it, it was kind of interesting because I did not have the experience that you had as far as like, you know, your parents loving it. Where like I had to like smuggle the VHS like from my friend's house because I couldn't see it in theaters. I wasn't allowed to see it. And I wasn't really allowed to see it in VHS. But I think my mom discovered it and... Like was kind of okay with it. Like, <laughs> I had to watch the first ten minutes with her, like, to make sure it was okay. And she was like iffy about it, but I was like, okay, fine. So I remember this movie being like, oh, I'm being like naughty and watching Austin Powers, and like, oh, there's jokes about like peeing, which I don't find funny, but it's like subversive, and I'm such a cool middle schooler, whatever. <laughs> I was, like, We're like eleven or something. 1987, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that. Watching it again, I realized I had watched this a million times, knew way too many of the lines, made, knew way too many of the shots. Hadn't seen it in widescreen, though, so that was kind of fun. Mm. There are people in this movie that I thought disappeared, but are actually there in the side <laughs> the whole time. So, what a discovery. For 26 uh, years, I thought henchman number seven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Left and bottom of the left. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I think there are interesting things to talk about. I wrote... I wrote Eight notes down uh, that I think could provide a roadmap for us. Okay. Number one is and, and crush seventeen on... that definitely will not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. We'll get to them as we dive in. But uh, Trisha Brian, Brian, tell us about us. Awesome Go to Brian. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this was definitely a movie I saw with with my buddies when I was, you know, in high school. Um, I can't remember if it was the first or the second, but I want to say it was the first that we could like walk to a movie theater, um, a neighborhood over from our house, and we we went and saw this movie. Uh, that movie theater is a gas station now. So, um, <laughs> wow, wow, yeah. Yeah. what a downgrade! And then, <laughs> a small theater or a huge gas station? It was a very small theater. I think that had two theaters in it. Um, and uh, but the the biggest uh, and then I and then I ended up seeing you know the sequels and, and really loving them. I love the opening to Goldmember. I think it's brilliant. Um, 
And, uh, but, but the biggest memory of Austin Powers for me is my high school, uh, every year does a thing called Follies, uh, which is sort of an SNL type skit show mixed with talent show. So it's like a, a cast does skits and then like people who audition to like have their band come play or do a dance thing or whatever, do performances in between. And my senior year, we did an Austin Powers themed, uh, uh show and, Guess who played Austin Powers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was really disappointed with your greeting, Brian. We did a <laughs> full on Austin Powers right at the top here. I mean, that's what you're expecting. That's why that's why I made it just straight laced and professional. Thanks. I'm mm. excited to be part of this discussion. Um, no, but uh, and then the finale, which I think was my idea, kicked off. It was a Wayne's World sketch where we have Dr. Evil on as the guest. But then I, as Wayne, reveal myself that I'm actually Austin in disguise. It's very meta. Um, nice. And <laughs> uh, fortunately for all of you, the VHS rip I have of it is way too low quality for anyone to ever see it. So I think we'll we'll <laughs> leave it at that. Um but yeah, so Austin Powers has an extra special place in my heart because of that very strange experience I had in high school. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, these movies are fun. And I, you know, I also grew up like Wayne's World was my jam growing up, especially. So it's just like the the general Mike Myers soft spot in my heart um, for all the, the, you know, like Jim Carrey and Mike Myers, right? Just that whole and Adam Sandler, that whole like, here's a bunch of dumb, funny movies that are like sometimes kind of smart and sometimes just poop humor um that i grew up on uh and austin powers definitely fits right in there it's sometimes <laughs> both of those things yeah, oh yeah <laughs> absolutely yes. yes cool okay hey trisha hi what are your thoughts on austin powers um i mean i didn't see this movie when it came out or anywhere close to then i think i saw it mm. i don't know five years ago something like that um Interesting. i mean so here's the thing there are a few like genres of films that I just like, I like, I have seen none of them kind of thing. Um, and one of them is like war movies. I've seen, especially Vietnam war movies. I've seen like none of them pretty much. Um, except apocalypse now, which I watched for this podcast. Like, <laughs> right. And so, yeah. And another one is nineties comedies. Like I've seen zero of them um for whatever reason at the time you know i have i think stricter parents like you do michael and so at the time i'm sure i wasn't allowed allowed to see it um so that might have been my excuse but also at the time i don't know if i i wasn't really a james bond fan yet i was still pretty young for that it probably wouldn't have really interested me to see this. Um, and so I just didn't see it back then. And then as an adult, it's kind of hard to get on the wavelength <laughs> of some of the humor here, uh, you know, when you're in your thirties and, uh, especially as someone who is like a genuine James Bond fan. Um, and it was always confusing to me too, because I like watched them. And then I was like, so much of this is a James Bond parody, but so much of it is also not, and I never understood, like, what is being referenced here and, like, blended in um, that is all, all of the stuff that clearly isn't James Bond. So, like, all the, like, swinging London stuff is, like, not really Bond. Like, even back in the 60s, not much. And then, like, the look of the character is not Bond at all. Um, and so I just kind of never got what the joke was. Like a few of the jokes I get, it's like, that's a very direct reference to this like evil villains lair. Like, and obviously Dr. Evil is Blofeld. And like, I get some of these things that are specifically being parodied. Uh, but then other things I never understood. So <laughs> this time around, uh, I did a bunch of research and I was like, and I've realized that Mike Myers pulled his influences from, like, everywhere. Um, he had a ton of influences here. Uh, not This is not strictly a James Bond parody. The look comes from a character named Jason King, who was a British, with the star of a British TV show. Um, that was, like, uh, I want to say, I, like, looked it up, but it was, like, he's, like, a a castle type of guy. If you remember that American TV show castle where he's like a novelist, but he ends up like going on international adventures or something. But the look is a more of a reference to that. And I was like, hmm. okay, mm -hmm. if I had understood that, maybe this would have been like funny to me. Um, 
and a variety of other influences that Mike Myers pulled from. Um, so anyway, I feel enlightened after the experience of revisiting mm-hmm. this film. Uh, but I wouldn't say, I, I'm not going to lie and say that it like means anything special to me. It does not. Sorry. <laughs> that is okay. <laughs> well, it, <clears throat> just on the topic of, you know, yeah, what what is going on with this character? How is this a James Bond spoof, et cetera? I've always read it as just looking at the kind of absurdity of just the 60s and, you know, British 60s psychedelic culture and just doing a, like a just a blend, kind of a goofy blend of what if the sex symbol of the time like was transported to today, mm-hmm. how weird that would look. The bad teeth, the bad clothes, the like totally outdated sexual mores that don't fit anymore. And so I think, yeah, to me, it was always like James Bond kind of came out of the 60s. Also, this counterculture British psychedelic music scene came out of the 60s. And it's kind of like, what if you just took all that and transplanted to the 90s? What would happen? So I always saw it as being those two halves and the kind of out of placeness is is the comedy. I see that. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's also Mike Myers. Um, a lot of this movie is a tribute to his dad and the stuff that his dad got right. him into. Um, and then that's why you, you have uh, Michael York and Robert Wagner and Michael Caine as his father in the, in the third movie. Um, and, and it's just sort of like here, here's a bunch of things from the, the late 60s that, that inspired me or that I got from my dad, some of which is Bond, some of which is this music scene. Um, he was in in the band Mint Tea with Matthew Sweet, which is like the band that you see in these movies. Um, and uh, and like that, he just kind of, you know, Mike Myers, basically his all of his stories are like I was in the tub and I would start doing a voice and then I'd ask my wife if this voice was funny. You know, like that's where that's where a lot of his <laughs> ideas come from is just him like messing around with his band or his wife and just being like, what what about that? Uh, One billion dollars. Is, is this funny? I don't know. Um, <laughs> 90s comedies. Right. Right, th- right there. Right. But yeah. but I also think that what's interesting I also think that what's interesting is there are so many Bond spoofs, but I feel like the ones the the ones that have made it at all are the ones that are like, but we're also doing our own thing, you know, get smart and um, Mm -hmm. Austin Powers and even like to a lesser extent, like Johnny English, where it's where it's just like. Yeah, we're going to sort of start as a Bond spoof and it's like uh, we're going to like literally put Dr. Evil in the Blofeld outfit. You know, we're literally going to do right. some of that stuff, but then we're also going to be our own thing. And I feel like if you're not also being your own thing, then it's like how far can you take that? Right. And and, I, and that is something I appreciate about Austin Powers is it just feels like it feels like a spoof, but it, without being that sort of direct like it's not spy hard. Right. It's not right. that very direct mm-hmm. spoof. It's sort of like, here's like a quirky take on a thing, but it's going to be, but I'm going to make it just the Mike Myers brand of, of that thing. Yeah. And I do think it's interesting. I, so not only did I go down a rabbit hole of influences on what the hell Austin Powers is, um, <laughs> but I also went down a rabbit hole of like parody, the history of like parody and spoof. Mm. which is fascinating Um, because we've never talked about any on here and it's a pretty old genre actually, you know? Uh, And so I I was reading, you know, there's obviously like Monty Python existed. Mel Brooks was doing his thing. Um, But actually it was in 1980 Zucker Abrahams and Zucker made airplane. And Mm -hmm. that, Mm. I mean, honestly, like it's kind of this like seminal, like spoof, film that really influenced the the filmmakers of the 80s and then into the 90s um, and kind of revived the genre. But the interesting thing about that, to your point, Brian, is that the plot of Airplane, I hadn't realized this, but it's directly lifted from another disaster movie starring mm. Dana Andrews, who, who the name right now is escaping me. But the the plot is literally directly lifted so much so from a straight like straight faced uh, disaster movie that they had to get remake rights to actually make airplane because they just yeah. took the plot of whatever um, and so like to your point I think the interesting thing about these films about the uh, Austin Powers movies I don't know if I've seen Goldmember I'm going to be real but I do I, I do remember seeing Spy Who Shagged Me and they're 
because they're pulling from everywhere, they actually do end up doing something kind of unique and they've really become their own thing, right? Um, and because Austin is not a direct knockoff of James Bond, he's a blend of all these other characters and, you know, like the the situations he finds himself in are sometimes borrowed straight from James Bond movies, but there's no dance numbers in James Bond movies (laughs) and and things like that. So they do kind of, yeah, take on their own sort of tone and their own thing. The other thing about, about a lot of those straight 80 spoofs that uh, Zucker Abrahams and Zucker made is that no one in them seems to be in on the joke. And that's kind of what makes them funny, right? Where it's like airplane, they took serious actors and they just had them basically play it seriously. And that was the joke, right? Mm-hmm. Leslie Nielsen was not a comedic actor before they put him in an airplane and they were like, no, don't just, just say it, you know, just say the line straight. And they were meticulously mm-hmm. scripted also, those films. And so, you know, they made the Naked Gun series after that and a bunch of others. But like these movies in the nineties have this like improvisational lightness to them also because they were not heavily scripted or not as heavily scripted. And again, it kind of takes on its own life in a way that is refreshing. Hope you enjoyed this preview clip to continue the conversation and listen to the entire episode, head over to the beyond the screenplay Patreon. The link is in the show notes.